So, so hi everyone, I'm Sarah Vaughn, leader of the Eurasia Club. You all know me, but thank you so much for coming. And today we're really proud to have um, Sergei Arofeyev, a lecturer at Rutgers University and at the Davis Center as well, I believe, a lecturer at the moment. Yesterday. Yesterday? Nice, congratulations. So I'm really excited because we're gonna do Vladimir Putin's aggression today, and he's gonna be discussing the sociological implications and a lot of the other aspects around this war that we maybe don't talk as much about with us because we talk more about the security and the economics of it. So I'm very excited to hear a lot more just information on this today. So please join me in welcoming Sergei Arofeyev today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you everyone for hosting me today. It's a privilege and I'm aware of certain limitations of our communication because you'd usually look at the processes like this huge confrontation with Vladimir Putin's empire, as they say, um, from a more like security angle. And I'm going to into the roots of this phenomenon. In other words, I'm trying to look through a sociological lens at the nature of Putin's rule and Putin's war. And I will explain what means not just cultural, but interactionist approach to this understanding. When I see pictures like that, and there are many now, which really uh, create a sense of uh, sarcasm, uh, but the flip side of this understanding that Putin is a descendant of both Hitler and Stalin, uh, uh, the flip side of that is actually a sense of horror. We are horrified that for the first time in our history since the Second World War, we are facing <clears throat> something unexplainable. But is it so much unexplainable? Uh, my attempt is uh, to contribute to better understanding. Of course, uh, things like this, uh, when Boris Nemtsov is converted by Ilya Yashin, uh, contribute to the sense of um, encountering people with no limits, no moral obligations. Uh, the word is at Marojane. You can't even imagine how depraved they are. Uh, once Mitsov famously mentioned uh, to Yashin, and soon after that he was just killed. Something was um, at that time unimaginable. But that happened. Uh, the first hybrid war against Ukraine was unimaginable, but it happened. And to the full scale invasion, also up to a point, was hardly imaginable, but it happened. So, what is behind that? Um, one big uh, roadblock on the way of that understanding is that many people in the West see Putin's aggression against Ukraine as an old fashioned colonial war of imperial conquest. This largely overlooks the fact that Putin's actions are not characteristic of colonialism, but rather resemble tactics employed by a mafia state. What's the motivation behind that? Some imperial conquest? Of course not. That can be only a pretense or an instrument. The real motivation is to solve the internal problems of legitimacy and maintaining power. Well, these speculations continue and continue because, it, as I said, something unusual is in front of you, an international relations analyst, and you try to imagine what are the other possible excuses for Mr. Putin uh, to continue with his aggression. First, he talks about the Ukrainian Nazis, that he mentions something like terrorist state. Some in his flock would even say the word Satanism. In the end, many commentators don't go beyond uh, statements like we are facing here an old fashioned colonial war of imperial conquest. To totally disprove that, there's a task of social science which goes further intercultural and interactionist analysis. But uh, we have some resources from the past developments of our social science. And uh, I'm very happy to say that after 20 years of this post-Soviet academic development, uh, we have acquired some essential expertise. Some of that expertise stopped 
from developing, and stop developing at a certain point. And the case of Vadim Volkov is very, very special here. So he's still the person, the social scientist from the entire post-Soviet space who has been most quoted uh, because he produced uh, revolutionary research based on some previous uh, American theories. But Vadim Volkov came up before the full uh, state capture by the Russian mafia. He came up with the idea of violent entrepreneurs. His book was published um, in 2003 in English, uh, but that was based on his research into how gangs of racketeers operated in one specific Russian region in the Urals called Ural Mashovskia. One can immediately recall St. Petersburg and Tambovskia, uh, the other criminal uh, organized group. But the principle is the same. It is only possible in the period of transitioning to fully fledged market economy. So organized crime, which is rooted in the old Soviet practices, including uh, the legacy of the Gulag, this old organized crime at certain point met with the other practice of corrupt law enforcement and governance. So my task includes elaborating on Volkov and going beyond, adding some new conceptual uh, uh, feeding into that. So uh, this concept of violent entrepreneurs uh, helps understand how these two different sociocultural practices converged under the late modern market conditions. So the corrupt law enforcement, of course, first of all, is associated uh, in our minds with the resources of FSB, uh, the successor to KGB. My chief thesis is that the convergence of these two practices has resulted in the mafia's takeover of the state in Russia. Uh, here's the moment when I could uh, recall a very, very famous phrase, many times quoted in many languages all around the world. For the first time, criminals who captured an entire state and made this state itself an instrument of their monstrous crimes, stand trial. The words belong to Roman Rudenko, chief prosecutor for the USSR at the Ruth Nuremberg trial. He later became the procurator general of the Soviet Union. So he applied uh, that to the Nazis, of course. And it's true that the entire state of Germany was captured in the 1930s by a highly ideologized and highly organized group. But there is a principal difference between the state capture in Germany uh, in 1930s, in the 1930s, and in the early 2000s in Russia. Uh, you may think that uh, they are almost identical, but that's only in the form, not in the content, not in the nature. But he himself participated in Stalin's purges, actually. Yes, uh, he was an unpunished. Uh, uh, Stalin's henchman, Rudenko. Here uh, is what uh, really can, in a condensed form and slightly simplified form uh, shows uh, how the system works. First of all, let's remember that Russia as a whole country with its history is a system. So when we talk about civil society within Russia, it's a subsystem. When we talk about the government system, the power system, it's another subsystem, but in itself, uh, it's a system, and it exists thanks to this concentric organization. The mafia is at the very core of the system, and it's actually very, very small. What is really huge is the, uh, mm, the corrupt bureaucracy, which gets incorporated in this, into the system of power, which uh, people who are co-opted through corruption through special privileges, through preferring the interests of the core, of the mafia, to the interests of the country, 
and the population. And of course, the outer uh, layer or circle here is the indoctrinated population. And we all know how much uh, has been invested by Putin's system into propaganda. There is another thing. Uh, when I talk about that uh, concentric uh, organization of Putin's power, it's uh, primarily to do with the social, entirely social roots and structures behind that. But we cannot really deny that there is always an individual factor. Uh, the system of rule in Russia is highly personalistic. We call it personalist dictatorship. Uh, and there's a sort of consensus about that. And because of that, we have to pay special attention to the pivotal element of that system, the core of the mafia core, which is this individual. This guy as you will expect from me as a sociologist, of course, has a, a number of socially conditioned motivations of his behavior. Uh, of course, when we proceed to someone like Putin, there's always the black box factor. There are certain things which we cannot predict. Uh, he can have some sociopathic uh, features which are not easy to organize. I will refer later to some people who did make an attempt at that. But here I claim that the socially expressed, the visible, the measurable, sociologically measurable motivations can be hierarchically organized within this pyramid. It's not the vanity of Putin and the desire to leave a trace in history that reigns supreme. It's an epiphenomenon uh, of other things. What is more important, and that has always been at the core of Alexei Navalny's fight, is the uh, practices, practices of corrupting the government system, the system uh, of power in Russia. And uh, this is done through excessive conspicuous consumption, not just consumption, but excessive conspicuous Consumption, because it's believed that within, uh, with it's believed within that archaic mafia logic, uh, that uh, the conspicuousness of this consumption and the excessiveness of that uh, really helps to glue the system of power together. But even more important than that, what Alexei Navalny, I'm sure, understood but never emphasized emphasized too much for political reasons, is the pursuit of domination. There is no uh, desire to be excessively rich uh, without the desire of dominating the others within such traditionalist systems of power. But the, at, the, at the very bottom, the absolutely defining motivation of them all is the fear of retribution. In 2008, uh, Putin temporarily uh, let uh, his warm seater to be uh, president, but then he returned in 2012. Why? Uh, the main reason of that, which is sociologically measurable, is the fear of retribution. Just because the amount of crimes previously committed by Putin and his associates is unbearable for him to think of stepping down. If you step down, you will not be simply punished. But according to the uh, emotional and uh, aesthetic sets of sensations within that culture. Uh, the consequences can be just absolutely unbearable. And one can refer to Muammar Gaddafi's death here. So it's easy to figure out that within this traditionalist fear of retribution, this picture is standing in front of Mr. Putin's eyes has been since many years ago. So uh, may might return to that during the questions. Fine. Uh, another building block for developing this socio-cultural approach to Putin's power is uh, the economic sociology approach. Again, I'm referring to Vadim Volkov, who followed Tilly and uh, developed the conception of the dual function of the record. What the Rakitia does and what the Oral Mashevsky and Tambovsky in St. Petersburg did 
in the 1990s. They created, they manufactured threats. And at the same time, they started to offer protection services. This racket is a protection racket. It's a phenomenon of modern uh, in market uh, uh, society. The other building block, which I'm referring to, is the ethnographic approach uh, by another sociologist called Svetlana Stevenson, who wrote her book, Gangs of Russia. Does it ring the bell? Gangs of Russia. From the streets to the corridors of power. The Russian version title is Life According to Panyatia. Uh, so uh, when uh, uh, the top representatives of that mafia core speak publicly, they practically use uh, panyatia, which are characteristic of those gangs from the late Soviet times that Stevenson analyzes. Just look at Putin's words. Whoever slights us will not live three days. Кто нас обидит, не проживет и трех дней. Трех дней не проживет. Or snap them out into their trains. Мочить в сортире. This is the language characteristic of very specific and well-known culture in the late Soviet times. Uh, but uh, uh, Putin, while he was uh, really growing up in a very deprived conditions, not even working class, but almost underclass, uh, there are other people in so-called intelligentsia boys, and not only Lavrov, which, whom I'm quoting here, but Medvedev, for example, um, who got related, co-opted into this mafia core and appropriated the language of these gangsters. The lad said, the lad did. Patsan сказал, Patsan still. Then Lavrov even uses the word panyatia referring to the values of these gangs. Such panyatia should be respected at the international level as well. He was not ashamed even to use the word. Uh, when we try to make sense of these two building blocks and bring them together, uh, we look further at the behavior of these guys and we explicate what is panyatia, notions, patsan's code. Patsan is the word for, for lad, a uh, member of street gangs, uh, youth street, street gangs. So it's values and norms as tools serving the gang's interests. Uh, recently, Svetlana Stevenson wrote beautifully about the Kremlin Fienia, the jargon, uh, parts of which I just mentioned. As in other traditional owner cultures, panyatia include the need to dominate in any situation. That's why I said it's more important for within the framework of uh, Putin's motivations to dominate compared to owning enormous riches. So owner cultures are uh, represent, uh, representative of the traditionalist way of life. Whereas in the modern society, we strive to develop the culture of dignity. That's how the American uh, legal foundations were built uh, two centuries ago and more. Uh, that's uh, why we call the revolution in Ukraine the revolution of dignity, because dignity presumes respect and dialogue and modern balances, development and progress. Honor cultures um, are there when you want to maintain the old order and dominate over complex structures with the use of very primitive tools. So that's honor cultures. Uh, what is a very important to understand. Um, they, the rep representatives uh, of these cultures, uh, emphasize loyalty to fellow gang members and no real obligation to those who do not belong to the gang. Here uh, uh, is a reference to a recent phenomenon which really shook the entire Russian society. I mean, the production and release of Solova Patsana the TV uh, drama series uh, can be translated the lad's word, blood on the sidewalk. So the word is the very center of this honor culture, the unity of word and action, which is 
actually betrayed from time to time, but this is the appearance, this is the impression uh, that culture wants to make. The ascriptive uh, uh, definition of uh, these young youth gang members mm -hmm. since the 1970s, 1970s at least, is gopniki, gopniks, which means simply hooligans. But their self-definition, self-description is famously patsanni, patsans, uh, as referred by uh, Lavrov. On the left, you can see those characteristic patsanni, um, that type of uh, appearance was already developed in the 1970s. The picture probably comes from later. Uh, here is another interesting phenomenon that in, very recently, just within days, uh, the Kremlin administration apparently has started to promote the ideas uh, connected with this TV crime series <laughs> in connection with the forthcoming elections. The public reaction to Slova Patsana was very mixed. Some were outraged that it's a kind of glorification of criminal culture, how can we do that? The others would say, oh no, it's a social critique. By showing that, we show how horrible it was in those days. But some even go further and they say that actually uh, the TV drama exposes the real nature of the current rule in Russia. That's look back in order to understand who is ruling the country today. And it's interesting that they actually, um, they, I mean, the Kremlin, they actually decided to uh, uh, to use the aesthetics of this TV drama to call for the honor culture of the majority of Russians. Be honorable, go and vote for Putin. That's the, what is implied here. Здорово, пацаны. Я прошиваться пришел. А чё в нашу контору пришел? Да надоел бы чушпаном. А чё с пацанами? Well, Chuchpan is the derogatory expression, which means it's a despised commoner, whom you can really... Enormous. <laughs> uh, whom, you, uh, whom you can terrorize, unless you're Patsan. If you're Patsan, you're part of the mafia, part of this community of people of honor. What's the title say? Only you yourself can make the choice. Пацаны! Здесь пусть каждый сам решает, как быть. Я, если что, и один пойду. Кто со мной? Тот со мной. Вы не готовы все! Я на вас сейчас на всех смотрю! Вы не готовы! А что ты дрожишь, ты стоишь? Простите, пацаны. Excuse me, пацаны. Пацаны, не извиняйтесь. For us, there is no limit. So, in those days, Americans are against us. So, come, we fight America. Birds and dogs take the chushpan. Now, remember, the pacans choose. The chushpan is what they Remember that pacans are those who choose in this life, and chushpan are just uh, should keep silent. The three days of Putin's elections. Now, I will you know who made this video? Wow. Uh, we don't know exactly. It's gone, it went viral on uh, Russian Telegram channels. And the best question I got from Eugenia Albats yesterday was, uh, is it actually promoted 
by the Kremlin. Oh, it's one of those many, many boxes. So in the end, of course, who, who else benefits from that? So we can conclude that easily. Uh, but I'm not sure if so far this has been shown on television. But the Telegram channels are exploding with that. So these are the guys uh, coming from different time period. It's important to understand the, the evolution of Patsani and the criminal culture. Uh, again, Patsani call themselves a real Patsani or concrete Patsani, not just any lads, not just any fellows, but those who are real, real meaning honorable and uh, really exercising their power to the maximum extent. And uh, their public presentation, however, changed. On the left, it comes from my city of Kazan. I myself uh, knew three young people who were killed in street fights in the city of Kazan. And Kazan was especially notorious in the 1980s for uh, being the center of uh, youth crime. On the right, you see something which we hardly talk about anymore. Uh, the idea, the concept of new Russians in the 1990s. They started to look differently. Yes, in the 1990s, street fights continued, but the real uh, uh, pinnacle of that was in the 1980s. It's really interesting how the aberrations of memory work. Uh, often people think that the deficit time, the time of deficit was in the 1990s, not earlier. Whereas it was totally vice versa. The same is true about uh, uh, the number of uh, street crimes and fights between the gangs. But in the 1990s, uh, they started to enter the market economy. And this is the famous or infamous magenta jacket, Malina Pidrak, which symbolized even more than the golden chain that you belong to this uh, elite, no longer so much criminal, as the elite of traders and dealers entering the economy and dictating their rules and engaging all kinds of negotiations with the government. Like uh, in traditional mafia studies, when maf the mafia and the state are independent actors and they somehow interact. So that's the time when it really started to develop. Um, but we have the temptation that Putin, who rose from those ranks, uh, in his early childhood, and then exactly because of that, he decided to join the KGB to be more powerful. And in the 90s, he was a middleman between those magenta jackets and the government structures in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. uh, the temptation of false interpretation can be summarized as Putin the Great and Horrible. And this task of sociology is to uh, debunk that. So he's not great and horrible, but he's just a uh, mafia guy. Not uh, part of this uh, misinterpretation goes along with uh, observations like that of uh, uh, Frau Merkel when she says that Putin's not in touch with reality. This is wrong from the sociological point of view because the reality is there. It's just a different reality, very specific, where. Penyatia reigns supreme. Uh, in sociological terms, we can also continue this conversation um, referring to limited or bounded terrorist rationality. But every time we have to remember what is behind the terrorist rationality and the impression that he's totally unwind, that he goes haywire and can do whatever he wants. Behind that is the absolute thirst for pleasure in life. And you know how many residences Mr. Putin has, not only in Russia, but also abroad. Um, he has not just one yacht, but many. And his associates, his inner core, at least, uh, of that mafia, uh, they have to follow the same pattern of excessive conspicuous consumption. They have to have yachts, they have to have uh, business jets, they have to have palaces. But the Supreme Palace should be only one. So the most magenta of all magenta jackets should belong to the boss of the bosses, to so the capo di tutti capi, or pachan uh, Many 
people wonder why is it so horrible the taste of this Gelangir Palace on Black Sea built by a prominent Italian architect for Mr. Putin. The answer is there. It's not for the aesthetic purposes to please the wider audiences. And here I suggest that we look uh, at the example of that palace to explain the behavior of this Patsani in power. And this plays a very spe specific role in intercultural regulation. Okay, let's look at that palace, which is the most expensive uh, bribe in human history, as Navalny said. Um, does it have any state function? Did Mr. Putin want to entertain uh, President Obama there when the uh, palace was built? No. Uh, is there any economic sense there? Did he want to invest and then sell with profit? Absolutely not. Was it something recreational? Mr. Putin maybe wanted to retire and enjoy life to the maximum in this uh, best of all recreational places? No, there's no recreational function. He hardly goes there and definitely was not going to retire there. So the only function which we can sociological, sociologically uh, single out here is cultural or ritualistic. It's again about the gang members uh, showing loyalty to the same core values of this uh, cultural system and uh, make their contributions uh, as Navalny and before he um, uh, was the uh, listener of his name, I think, uh, um, expressed that very clearly. People just have to bring it to that altar. Uh, Navalny even used the word altar. The altar of their paganistic belief system, system of beliefs. That's why he needs such a palace. But at the same time, look at that uh, cryogenic baths. Cryogenic baths are always there, almost always in his residences, because this is believed to be something which extends someone's life. Because the mafia boss doesn't want to die like Gaddafi or like Ceausescu or like Hitler. He's no no Lenin, not driven by huge ideas to change the world. He wants just beautiful life, domination, and live possibly forever. And cryogenic baths are very important for that, like some practices of alternative medicine and shamanism, like the blood extracted from antlers. Um, dear antlers, it's believed to really extend your life. Um, so within the system, cultural uh, system of beliefs, there are things uh, which can be uh, also explained by looking at what is very popular in this country, the Stanislavski method, the actor's super objective. So the actor has um, to practice excessive conspicuous consumption and corruption for that sake in order to sustain it and to sustain the power. Live and rule for as long as possible, creating the popular sense that it will always be that way. So nothing changes. It's very, very traditionalist because the modernist idea is constant choice and constant change. Ensure loyalty through cultural means, intercultural regulation. Now I'm getting to the end of my presentation to explain, uh, to refer to uh, very important uh, American tradition, and then not only American, uh, what helps us understand how this all works. The idea of secondary deviance, that's what is very important. Uh, the criminal, imagine you're a young boy who wants to please uh, make a great impression on your girlfriend, you steal a bicycle, then you are labeled as a hooligan or young criminal, and then you have to decide whether you will stick with that label or not. This is called secondary deviance, stigmatization and encouragement. Well, here we can look at how the West has historically contributed to Putin's deviant Gopnik career. We have all contributed to uh, encouraging this label. The other tradition, also American, is uh, understanding impression management. So toughness versus covetous and negotiation, conspicuous consumption, always full the spectators always make them think what you really are not. And then the tradition, uh, then we, I will mention the transition from the study of mafia state relations to the study of 
mafia states. So in connection to what I just said, the two names should be mentioned here, and uh, they are associated with what we call microsociology of the tradition called symbolic interactionism. So Irvin Goffman is one of the greatest figures in American sociological history. Uh, he exactly talks about this impression management techniques, face saving and holding line techniques. So we all participate in kind of theatrical communication. He actually proved Shakespeare right, that the world is a stage and men and women are merely actors. Uh, and the same happens to our political leaders. We have to remember that. We are trying to hold the line, not to escalate, face the opponent's face. And the other guy is uh, Howard Becker, who further developed the uh, conception of secondary deviants and deviant career. So Putin is not just a deviant, but he is someone who has, over years, developed his career as a deviant, which is the more generic word for criminals and terrorists. So deviants is socially defined, socially con conditioned. In the Russian um, tradition, it would sound like лучше грешным быть, чем грешным It's better to be a sinner than to be rumored as one. And the third uh, thing here is uh, quite recent, uh, first developed uh, by our Hungarian colleagues, Balint Madiar and Balint uh, Madlovich, uh, who uh, wrote extensively about the anatomy of post-communist regimes. There they give a definition of mafia state, which I find very, very um, inspiring to sociologists. Mafia state is a state ruled by an adopted political family, patrimonializing political power in a democratic environment. The word patrimonializing is uh, the key here, because uh, in the situation of the state captured by mafia, you do not offer a Führer or leader uh, to your society you offer an artificial father figure who is presumed to know everything better, or he's just luckier than anybody. And that's exactly how Putin uh, became the centerpiece of this mafia state. His personal qualities fit absolutely perfectly that purpose of patrimonializing political power. Now, of course, there is a lot of uh, rejection of that. So many Russians call them diet the old man, grandfather, trying to disprove the idea of this imposed father figure. But that's what has worked for, for a very long time now. So this uh, political power uh, can exist only in a democratic environment because it can use it in predatory ways. The modern democratic uh, social system is complex. It's developed. It's uh, uh, something uh, which is mm, more agile, generally speaking, from a more historical perspective, but it's exactly for that reason is vulnerable in the face of those cultures which use asymmetric ways, mm -hmm. how to parasitize on them. So they're behaving as predators because they're using the asymmetry of knowledge, the asymmetry of use of the rule of law, and uh, they routinely step over formal laws and operating the state as a criminal organization. So it's a combination of a clan state, near neo patrimonial state, and predatory state. It's a criminal state. So what I did uh, on top of that was trying to explain that's in Russian, my interviews to Radio Liberty, to explain how this symbolic interactionist analysis of impression management works in the case of Putin's uh, power system. And uh, when I earlier presented the pyramid of Putin's motivations, uh, I also meant to come later to uh, Waller and Ares King, those guys who really looked more closely at the trauma and insecurity of Mr. Putin on the personal level. Their um, report is called Nursing Injustices. And they were inspired in particular by writing that report 
by uh, the experience of the American analyst, pre-CIA analysts who did the psychological profiling of Adolf Hitler during the Second World War. Um, I would like to conclude with a simple idea that uh, in this clash of civilizations, not at all in the spirit of uh, Huntington, but in reality, where two orthodox Christian cultures oppose each other. So in this real clash of civilizations, we have these three fronts. Uh, the front number one is the Ukrainian battlefield. The front number three is the Russian civil society uh, with the head, figurehead of Navalny and other leaders. But it's a third front, which is very complex. Certain things are impossible within the country. Uh, some other things are happening in the diaspora. But the second front is the West, is the democratic liberal world, which has been displaying some response. And we all admired how uh, the pro-Ukrainian coalition at the very beginning of the war came together to help the fighting nation. But there are two major um, problems here. Because the second front of the free world has not displayed proactive behavior towards the front number one. Everything the West has been doing has been only reactive. It could be done better, it could be done worse, but not proactive. Uh, in relation to the third front, to what Russians are trying to do, the West hasn't shown enough strength, hasn't contributed to delegitimizing Putin's rule. Why is it happening? Uh, I can present it in this simple uh, way. So lack of understanding who the aggressor is, what is his culture, what is the nature of Putin's rule and the nature of Putin's war. So this lack of understanding of Putin and in different way, the Russians, leads to unfounded or you can call it false fear of escalation. This is the psychological thing which is there and we should somehow manage that. Why is there so much fear? Is it because Mr. Putin can blow us up, all up in nuclear Armageddon? As a sociologist, I will not take that seriously, exactly because of what I just explained in my presentation. So this unfounded fear leads to the lack of due response to the situation. How do we help Ukraine? How do we help ourselves? Only by stopping seeing Putin as uh, someone great and terrible. He's not a great and terrible. He's someone who is a mafia gangster, uh, who knows what he's doing. We think that we know what he, what he knows, but we don't know what he knows, usually. We need extra analysis for that. And this knowledge will really help us uh, move towards a simple solution of all that. The simple solution is just there. Everybody knows. You are specialists in security. You know perfectly well. Just the sufficient number of long-range missiles will help to drive Putin out of Ukraine. Once uh, Crimea is isolated, the war is practically over. And then the new phase will start of Mrs. Mr. Putin's war on his own land against his own people. It can be figuratively called civil war. I'm not talking about bloodshed necessarily, but it's a civil conflict which started in 1918 and hasn't been resolved since then on the Eastern European, entire Eastern European space. So uh, Volkov is not actually the very first person who tells us that we are dealing with uh, criminals. Uh, before him, there was this American anthropologist, Francis Yanni, who also suggested that the mafioso's end goal is quiet, peaceful pursuit of respectability. So Mr. Putin doesn't want to die in nuclear Armageddon. What he wants is to live a nice life and possibly not be punished. The fear of punishment has driven him throughout all this history. Uh, he is, of course, fear, a fearful guy, like he fears uh, COVID. Uh, and that's why we often say he sits at this 20-feet table with <laughs> President Macron. 
But the other side of that is again to do with impression management and intercultural regulation, because he wants to show his power, his distance, his special honor. It's uh, very much like his famous delays at public events. So this is all filled with the impression management techniques in order to stay in power, in order to avoid uh, to avoid punishment. Well, well, when will the war end? Let's finish with that. Considering Putin's inability to initiate a nuclear conflict, and I argue he would not do it, uh, not even on the Ukrainian battlefield, uh, with tactical weapons. Since he is incapable of that, Ukraine can easily win if the West pr provides the due response to Putin's behavior. Uh, Ukraine's victory is a necessary but not sufficient condition for Putin's downfall because we are having that whole mafia culture. Uh, it must be recognized that at this point, the resources of Putin's system far surpass the consequences of conceding defeat on the battlefield and framing, another sociological word, framing NATO as the principal adversary now operating on the Russian territory. It's just developing in front of our eyes. Okay, so this is just another word uh, to add to the thesis, don't be afraid. And I would like to conclude that with a famous quote from Maria Sklodowska Fury, who said that nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so we may fear less. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Yeah, so I'm going to start with, I think, I'll try to minimize time to give everyone some time to think, but I have several questions. I think what stands out to me is particularly in the policy field, looking at all of this, which I love this framing and analysis. By the way. I thought it was fantastic and interesting and something that's not discussed enough at this school. But I think one thing we struggle with a lot is how to combine these two concepts. You mentioned especially about it's better to be seen as a sinner as opposed to like be thought of as a sinner and this leaning into this kind of criminal reality. And so it's hard to kind of how do we properly approach Russia, I think, from the Western perspective where we do see them as a kind of a criminal enterprise, but at the same time, and we want to push them, but at the same time, we would also like to you know, normalize relations to some extent. So it's kind of this give and take situation of how do you actually like continue to help Ukraine and push against the Russian regime while just further criminalizing Putin kind of still gives him more power in some sense. It's a great question, Sarah. The simple answer to that is um, don't be afraid. Sorry for repeating that. Don't be afraid because, because Putin has already been labeled second recipient. There is nothing to add to that. There's no further escalation. Uh, by thinking that you are afraid of escalation, he can continue with the status quo. He is not going to conquer the world. It's not part of his culture, it's not his nature. All he wants is just to keep the status quo. In order uh, to be successful with you, he has to make the impression that he will escalate, that there will be another round of slights and offenses which will lead him to uh, horrible retaliations and, you know, avenging the enemies. But his main enemy is not Ukrainians and not even Americans. His main enemy are the Russians. That, what is, that's a huge lack of understanding of that in a lot of Western analysis of Putin. I'm going to ask one more, then I will open it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think also another thing is I've seen this with, I think, Mark Galliotti and some other speakers and like scholars in this region discussing how it is more of a mafia gang criminal state. And I guess I'm wondering as well, just to clarify, is there any difference with how we in the West view sort of mafia gang related activity as opposed to the Russian model? And that I know metaphors are always kind of, or analogies are always kind of imperfect, but I'm wondering what are some key aspects we might be missing as what from a Western perspective relating to like Russian gang culture? I know Gopniks and all that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, Mark Gagliotti and uh, maybe even more Luke Harding, mm -hmm. the famous journalist from the UK, 
from the Guardian. They have made very significant contribution to the development of this discourse of the true nature of Putin's regime. But they were not sociological enough. So what I'm trying to uh, achieve is to complement that political analysis with some sociological analysis which goes deep into, the, into this nature. And this is uh, what helps answer your second part of your second question, uh, that um, the times when Russia could be analyzed in terms of mafia and state interacting, the, those times have long gone. In during the times when uh, Volker was writing, 2003 was the year when this uh, mafia state capture was actually accomplished towards mm -hmm. up to the arrest of Khodorkovsky. So that was the turning point. Of course, there were other turning points like uh, the uh, um, Russian and TV, television, and uh, other things. And of course, uh, the further we go, the more we suspect that the Moscow apartment building bombings. They're not done just by the Chechens, uh, because it all falls very nicely into the pattern of this criminal behavior. But again, uh, when we look at Russia, we cannot just, uh, by inertia, continue with this logic of mafia state interaction. We see what has never happened, not even Nazi Germany. The whole state has been captured by this mafia. So we have to change the whole uh, optics of looking at Russia today. Okay. Right, and then I'll go to Alex. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Sergey, for uh, a fascinating presentation. I, I wonder uh, the extent to which, uh, you know, the, the regime is personalistic uh, versus the entrenchment of the mafia core and the uh, kind of corrupt bureaucracy that you talked about. And, and it's, it's great in your answer to the last question, you've talked about some of the turning points uh, in, in history in terms of uh, the, uh, the criminal capture of the Russian state. But I wonder, uh, you know, many scholars ask this, if, if Putin were suddenly to uh, die tomorrow or if he were to uh, vacate power, uh, would there be a significant transformation of the system? And it seems to me that the way you've outlined this, there, there is still this mafia accord, whoever takes over for Putin would come from that group of people. Uh, is that a wrong characterization? I may be sounding as contradicting myself, but uh, I uh, am totally uh, convinced that within this personalistic system, uh, things will drastically change after Putin is no longer there, despite the fact that the mafia culture will be there, still there. But again, I have to emphasize, it's a very, very small part of the power system in Russia. The majority of what is associated with this mafia behavior and rule are those incorporated and co-opted bureaucrats, starting even with Lavrov and uh, Medvedev. The very, very core, like Kovalchuk's, like um, the Furs and Co's, the Rottenbergs, maybe the Rottenbergs will be both kind of closer to the ground. Uh, but many of them would be professors' children, people who got the taste of this advantage of mafioso behavior in the situation of this knowledge asymmetry and power asymmetry, and the asymmetry in complying with the rules of the society. So my, uh, there's nothing better in the sense than uh, the analysis coming from undoubtedly the best Russian political scientist, uh, Grigory Golosov. It came out just today. It was recorded a few days ago, but today Forbes, the Russian Forbes, it's an interesting phenomenon, by the way, why it still exists in Russia. Apparently, they lead it to those who represent the counterweight to the mafia core, but still belong to the Russian elite. So in that interview to, to the Russian Forbes, um, Golosov talks about that configuration after Putin is no longer there. He does it very, very accurately because he has to limit himself. He's still in Russia. But his analysis is the most profound analysis in that sense. And I would cite with Professor Golosov that there are so many elements within the system, power system, that the mafia core, he doesn't talk about that at all. Uh, but I should add that the mafia core is not going 
to play the key role. It's much more about the more modernist rather than traditionalist elements within, within the system file. So when you look at the second circle, the incorporate and to corrupt uh, bureaucracy, especially the most elite bureaucracy, there will be processes going on. Uh, formally, yes, uh, the regime may look for a while like the same Putinist regime, if, especially if they try to put forward a figure like um, Patrushev, for example. But uh, nobody can substitute Mr. Putin. And what will really resurface will be the typical 1990s fight of various actors. It's a quick follow-up of how many people about do you think are the true inner circle? Is there any amount of estimation or can we truly know it all? You know, the inner circle in my view, uh, and I'm now behaving like an astrophysicist, yeah, you're uh, looking at the universe before <laughs> even uh, we had uh, orbital telescopes. Um, so I'm speculating, but uh, there are many, it's like an onion, so many inner cores. The very, very core is only one person, because even Mr. Patrushev has uh, displaced lots of signs of typical bourgeois corruption. His grandchildren live abroad, his son is a minister. They want to be part of this respectable milieu in the end. Um, how many, in other words, I can rephrase you, how many crazy people there are? <laughs> My answer is even Putin is not crazy. He might be pathological in certain ways, but it's not our task. We are analyzing the socially, structurally conditioned features of his personality. So uh, I think uh, there is a very, the uh, inner circle, this mafia core is very, very small. We all remember the cooperative Ozera. So it's something which comes from the formative years. The 1990s were the formative years for this type of uh, mafia rule and behavior. And Putin was a part of that. And gradually he became the centerpiece of, of all of that. So once he's removed, uh, I think there are very little chances to continue with th this type of mafia rule. Um, well, thank you for the presentation, Professor. Um, so compared to other post-Soviet sort of authoritarian repressive regimes that maybe rely more on the use of force totally to maintain power. Um, would, what, I mean, I don't really see that as being the total case, at least in Russia, right? There seems like to be a combination of maybe ideological co-optation of the population or, I mean, using force, you know, to some extent and whatnot. But what do you think is the most, at least, effective or um, common approach that the regime uses to keep the general population in at least, you know, complicit and at the most, um, you know, just silent. This is um, the indoctrination right. uh, that you're referring to. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like for, I mean, you have the whole NATO scapegoating to an extent, but then you have uses of force to silence, but what has it adapted over time, changed? What's, what has been the most effective? Uh, this will be a little trick on my part. You probably know the idea of traditional values employed by Mr. Putin while trying to indoctrinate population. I would just change this word slightly and say not traditional, but traditionalist values. The only ideology that Putin has is obviously the ideology of uh, liberal market behavior, which is the only major means for him to have all those riches and engage in an excessive, conspicuous consumption, and through that maintain power. Because he believes that everybody's like him. Uh, the Western powers are like him, so the alter vision of the world is the ideal for him. He's not conquering the world. He's just want to divide uh, the spheres of influence. Uh, like any mafia boss, so they just divide the space. But he also thinks that uh, uh, the people of Russia are also the same simple-minded, simple that they don't understand that. This is a typical patrimonialist, traditionalist set of values. So everybody is like me. They only pretend to be democracies in the West, but Biden is also corrupt, and Schultz, they're all corrupt because I'm corrupt. It's a, in psychology, it's all projection. So psychological mm -hmm. projection. Uh, but the same kind of projection works in the internal impression management market. So Putin 
things that uh, people don't understand anything. They don't have their agency. Uh, if they don't do what I tell them to do, then they are under the influence of baddies from the outside world. So they don't have, as we say in Russian, subject agency. Uh, and this helps uh, his second layer of uh, corrupt bureaucracy, which includes, of course, his propaganda machine. It helps develop this false narrative, the illusion of unity uh, of rallying around the flag, the illusion that Putin is uh, someone great, it's a father figure who knows better. Why do people have no choice as they think? They wrongly think they have no choice. Uh, because uh, they see only that uh, blown out of any proportions figure, artificial, false father figure, and they think, mm, we don't like it. Uh, but he obviously knows what he's doing. And he's definitely lucky. He's been so lucky for so many years, why not continue relying on him? That's the main point about that. This traditionalist uh, behavior trying to impose false, non-existing values, actually, because there is no imperialism in the Russian popular mind. Or oh, there is um, just as much imperialism as among the Brits or the Turks, uh, the French, um, any nation which has imperial past. There could be some grievances, but, you know, um, the old wisdom is if you don't want or you want to develop further, don't scratch it. But he decided to scratch because that uh, served perfectly the purposes of this mafia state, state structure. Thank you, Sergey, for your presentation. So, but I have some comments. So, um, in my view, the uh, uh, those mafia like features of the Putin, of the Putin lead, of this clique, of uh, this inner or outer circle, actually don't necessarily contradict the colonial nature of Russia and colonial nature of the current Russia's war against Ukraine, I mean, against the West, against the modernity. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be so fast uh, to roll out those historical uh, legacy uh, social inertia and ideology. I think you probably read the recent uh, report, CSS report by Maurice Nigavaya, Michael Pimish, and Jade McLean about the Putinist ideology. Mm -hmm. So um, they challenged this perception uh, of, Putinism, of Putinism as the uh, personalist regime, saying that it's a whole system uh, and this uh, ideology is grounded in imperial national statism, Russian exceptionalism, and this historical narrative of the struggle against the West and the cult of great victory, so-called. So, how can you comment on this? Well, uh, Maria Snigova and uh, some other political analysts lack the, lack the most important thing, lack the level of sociological analysis. They jump at the conclusion that uh, this war is an imperialistic war without looking at the roots of this war. Uh, the sociological answer is very simple. When we say that Russians feel a mm, ressentiment, that Russians feel that they need an empire, the missing link is, what do they really feel? They feel that they, uh, in the 1990s, had a very negative experience of being thrown into the market economy, not because they lost empire. In the 1990s and 2000s, Russians didn't give a damn to that. It was scratching the wound by the specific propaganda of a specific mafia group which captured the state. Uh, Russians in that sense uh, are not different from any others. And a uh, really the fault of this approach is that they're essentializing the Russian special way. So in many ways, this type of analysis doesn't differ much mm -hmm. from the declaration of Russia's special way by the perpetrators themselves. So this type of uh, analysis actually contributes to diminishing our understanding of what is going on. Okay, thank you. Even though 